Hi team, welcome to Tim Talks. Today's conversation is all about lifestyle medicine. Not sure if you know what that is or really what it's all about. And that is our desired outcome is to have a conversation with Dr. Hunter and to just introduce new thinking, new skills, new hope, that power of being a champion for you, really winning your well-being. And we're gonna start by winning with lifestyle medicine. So Dr. Hunter, thank you so much for joining us today. We'd love to hear a bit about your story. Thank you, Carlette. I'm so happy to be here. So my name is Joan Hunter. I am a native of uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, and now live in the Pacific Northwest where I moved to do my internal medicine residency program. So I'm an internal medicine physician, but in uh, 2019, actually, I learned about lifestyle medicine as a specialty. And it was through a uh, wellness group that I was part of, and they were having a talk by a lifestyle medicine physician. And I said, I don't know what that is, but I want to be that. And so once I found out about lifestyle medicine as a specialty, it really kind of took on its own life from there. And I was board certified in about nine months. Um, and I just love using these techniques to help people with their wellness and uh, it really helps me as a physician talk to other clinicians because lifestyle medicine is evidence-based. We have clinical trials that give us these guidelines to help people really make healthy habits that support their lifelong wellness. Well, I'm so grateful that you found it, that you love it, and that you're actually just from a growth mindset perspective, everything we're committed to doing is that you started with your love of medicine and becoming a doctor and just continued to add really your passion and what's important to you. And in our work as chief well-being officers and really champions for well-being, that's the fundamental is find what you love, make it a ritual and routine and really a lifestyle. And so we're going to start with what is lifestyle medicine? Just kind of take us through the introduction so that we can learn about this. So lifestyle medicine is different than any other kind of Western medicine. It is very what I call patient focused. So not only is it evidence based, but we really trust our patients and our clients to be the expert while as a clinician, I'm here as your coach. And it's very focused on whole person wellness. So you can see these are our six pillars of health. Um, but you know, really only two of them might have a lot to do with your physical health. So managing stress obviously is going to contribute to your health, your relationships. These are not things we really focus on and talk a lot about in Western medicine. So I love being able to approach patients and clients as the whole person and learn more from their perspective um, as the individuals that they are. And we really align around healthy behavioral changes that are going to impact your wellness for a lifetime. Oh, what a combination. And uh, there it is kind of that's our life in terms of our healthy eating, our activities, our stress management, what we're, you know, how we're sleeping, the relationships we're involved with. This is really in alignment with our well-being cue. How do we really raise our well-being intelligence? So take us through really knowing what we need, what's important, and how do we start to live this whole person lifestyle management? Awesome. We'll get started with that. And one reason this is so important, Carlette, is that we have very poor health in this country. This is what this is my why, right? We're one of the richest nations with the, the most expensive healthcare system, and we have some of the poorest outcomes. And this is a slide from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, which is where I got my certification. But this is the power of lifestyle medicine, is that if we were able to eliminate people's poor eating habits, get people moving, and specifically in toxin reduction, get rid of smoking, we could prevent in this country 80% of heart disease and stroke, which are still the number one and number two killer of, of adults in this country, 80% of type two diabetes, which is probably the new pandemic, um, and 40% of cancer. So I get chills when I talk about these percentages because um, this is the power that we have in as individuals to make healthy changes that will support our health for the long term and the right side of this just shows you these are the recommendations that that we make it is about really focusing on high value nutrition getting your daily physical activity healthy sleep my favorite topic um, your daily stress reduction techniques um, what that practice is going to look like for you including time for self-care 
avoiding smoking, and I'm going to talk more about alcohol because I don't think anyone really uh, thinks that smoking is something they should start, but a lot of us do consume alcohol, and then really creating those healthy connections. And I like to take it just one step further. This is this is my statement about lifestyle medicine. And when we think about what we can control in the world, there's really not much that we as individuals are in direct control over. And the two things that I think of are what I put in my body and what I do with my body. And I want you to think about how that relates to all six of those pillars of lifestyle medicine, right? You can think of healthy sleep as something that you do with your body. You can think of social media as something that you consume, not just food and, and water. So again, this really can put it back to um, kind of where can we focus and make changes on what we can control. Definitely a way to raise our well-being cue is just beginning to think about these two questions what I'm putting in my body and what I'm doing with my body. Love it. Yeah. And the mindset piece is huge in this and, and stress reduction, right? Um, you can choose to put negativity in your body or to, to breed positivity and then share that with others. So I really feel that it, that those two statements encapsulate, encapsulate those six pillars of health. So as we think about winning our well-being, it's all about really owning ourselves and what's important to us. And we call that being me cue. So it's really about the power of me and what I have the ability to control and not control. And if we start with stress as one of those, we know there's positive and negative stress, certainly from a sports perspective, working out, we know we've got to build up our body. We put some stress on our muscles so that we can actually get stronger. And so that's a positive stress. And then we have the stress of what we're thinking about. So we could actually be doing all the right things with our health. And internally, our self-talk is really beating us up or consumed with overthinking. And so really take us through the effects of what happens when stress is taking over. Yeah, and I love that um, you're reflecting on that because... Dr. Han Sai, who was the, the man who really coined the term stress, he said, I shouldn't have called it stress because there's good stress and bad stress. What we want to avoid is repeated bad stress or distress that causes strain, which is actually the deformation of our systems. And this slide here with what the effects of chronic stress could be are really because there's strain in our bodies uh, in, with, from repeated distress. So you, you may know someone who gave themselves a stomach ulcer because they were so stressed out or living in a, in a chronic stress or had a really stressful job. And, um, you know, we really do get the choice to internalize distress. Um, and as you said, not all stress is bad. You stress is actually good stress uh, that can lead to creativity, that can lead to production and performance, as you say. Um, but we can see how chronic stress and that distress and how we internalize it can really impact all of our major organ systems and create dis-ease. Disease in our bodies is from chronic stress and strain. And this is a quote from Dr. Sai that it's really not the stress that kills us but it's our reaction to it. It's how we choose to internalize it or let it go. You know, do we do we have it all the time? And um, sometimes it's hard because we have a thing called a brain and a, a, an autonomic nervous system, and we were built for survival. And it's really good when a saber-toothed tiger is chasing you or you're presented with danger that your brain automatically has to choose between fight or flight doesn't really leave you a lot of time to make a decision, but it's a survival mode. And the problem for a lot of us these days is that we live in survival. Um, you know, our brain reacts the same to the zebra and the tiger as it does to a high stress job or financial worries. Um, and so we have to really start making some choices about what we do to protect ourselves from this chronic stress that so many of us face every day. These are real things that we're dealing with. So Dr. Hunter really value and appreciate pointing out just the difference between that positive stress and that negative stress. And we now have the new awareness of it. We know in our work to really be that champion for change, we must be able to have new thinking. So how are we thinking about stress differently? 
some new skills to implement and to really be able to practice, 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 which gives us new hope. And one thing about really raising our well-being cue or our being me cue is that we need to own our actions, our reactions, and own our winning strategies, what is really working for us. So in our work, we are committed to not only giving information and also equipping us with very specific new skills that we can take and be like, okay, when I am managing my stress or when I'm feeling my stress, I know that it's a problem. I know that it's something that I, I need to improve on. What are our winning strategies? Yeah, and as you say, Carla, awareness is the first key, right? Because we live at such a high level of stress that we don't even realize we're stressed out. So really kind of being able to get into our bodies and feel where we're feeling that for my personal experience, it's tightness in my chest or something in the pit of my stomach. When you can have the space to say, oh, I'm feeling stressed right now. Is that how I want to feel? Is this serving me in this situation? And if the answer is no, then we get to make a different choice. And so knowing what techniques really work for you, because we are such individuals. So um, just like people express and uh, intake appreciation in different ways, the love languages, um, we intake and, uh, you know, the thing that helps me reduce from stress, which might be exercise or spending time in nature may not be the right thing for someone else. So it's really kind of getting to know yourself and what thing might work for you. I can share some tips that we know from the evidence of positive stress management techniques, but it's really kind of tuning in. That awareness is so important. What do I want to feel instead if I'm feeling anxiety? I'd like to feel some peace. Okay, well, how do I get there? You know, stop, take a few deep breaths, go back to the day. But it really is a practice, as you were alluding to, that we need to take some of these techniques forward um, and apply them on a day-to-day -day basis so that when we do have stress, we're actually coming to it from a, a greater place of peace based on our practice. So let me share a couple of these ideas. So gratitude is one of my favorite stress reduction techniques. And um, this is a quote from um, David Stindl Rast, who works in this area really extensively. And it's not joy that makes us grateful, but gratitude that makes us joyful. And gratitude is very simple. It's acknowledging and recognizing the positive things in your life. Um, and being in that positive space, it's it's the whole like attracts like idea that positivity brings more positivity in your life. So when I think of gratitude, it it could be big things, your family, your job, but it could also be really small things like clean air, fresh water, you know, seeing a beautiful sunset. And just acknowledging those things helps you see more of them. And it's a practice, right? So doing it on a daily basis in the moment when you're driving in your car and you see that sunrise or sunset, you know, saying, oh, that's so beautiful. Thank you. Um, this, this tactic is called three good things. So this was done in studies that people for 15 days kept a gratitude journal where every night they wrote down three things that happened that day or the day before. And they had to always be different, three different things each day. And also reflecting on why did it happen and what was my contribution? to making it happen. And this has been shown within 15 days to be a therapeutic intervention for depression and anxiety. And people who are more grateful are more positive. And when you're more positive, you can see the bigger picture and you can let go of some of the stuff that's really not important. Um, so this is a tool that I, I encourage all of my patients to use. So for us with the gratitude, that goes to another one of our well-being cues, again, raising that well-being intelligence. And that's all about giving hope and gratitude. When we think about we're being stressed and we immediately want to insert a new skill, reach for how can I either give hope to someone? It's beautiful to get out of yourself and connect with somebody else. And also gratitude, really begin to 
do the reps and get stronger in giving hope and gratitude. It's a great intelligence to, to commit to raising. You will see amazing results. We have found this so much. And Dr. Hunter, I really value and appreciate you sharing just the science behind, yes, it's something that makes us feel good, but physiologically we're, we're changing, our minds are changing, our body's changing, and most importantly, we're giving off from an energy perspective something positive. We're contributing in a positive way versus being negative. Now, I want to be very mindful of when we're feeling negative or when we're feeling depression, those are real. We are for you. We recognize that. We are adding an and rather than a but. So you absolutely, we honor that you are feeling negative or you are feeling depressed. And what can you be empowered to do to really win your well-being at this moment and reach for gratitude, reach to give hope? These are some winning strategies. Thank you so much for sharing that. And one way that I like to think of this is, you know, say your gratitudes out loud. If you're in a store, you know, I was in a pharmacy recently and the line was 15 people deep. They were 15 minutes from closing time. And the woman behind the cast register was just radiating positivity. She was kind to everyone. She didn't, no one felt like they were rushed. And when I got up to the line, I was like, thank you so much for the way you're showing up for everyone right now. And you know what? It made me feel good because I gave her a compliment and I really, you know, spoke to my gratitude about how she was treating others. And hopefully it made her feel good too. And it, it's a positivity cycle, right? I mean, we've all heard misery loves company, but actually we could, positivity loves company too. So we've got to speak gratitude out loud. As we keep thinking about how to really win well-being and raise our being me cue, meditation is certainly something that's very personal. Again, all of these winning strategies that we're talking about we are handing them to you to be empowered for you to try them on. Just go and give it a try and use our stat system. That is one of our key fundamentals in our work that we do. It's on a scale of one to 10. One is low, 10 is fabulous. Go out, give all these ideas a try and stat it up. That is the way that you are empowered. We want all of this to be about you. The stronger you are, more being for you, the more you're going to be able to give to our world. That's that whole person development. So as we share these ideas, jot them down, give them a try, practice, practice, practice. And as soon as you try it, give yourself a stat. On a scale of one to 10, I did this meditation and it was a four. My mind was racing all over. I couldn't sit still. I thought this was miserable. Okay, great. Thank you for your truth. Now let's try it again tomorrow by adding a few more winning strategies, new skills, and just see if we can raise your stat. So everything that we're introducing is a way of being. It's really this lifestyle that we want to introduce. So we're weaving together the new skills as well as getting coached up a bit on how to implement and practice the new skills so that you set yourself up for success. We know that change is incredibly difficult and it's not going to feel normal when you try something new and new thinking about that is, wow, I'm doing something new. Let me give this a try. What's my stat on it? And that way you're being able to pay attention and basically train yourself up on what's working for you and what's not. So let's talk about meditation and how to implement this practice. Yeah. And so many people say, oh, meditation sounds terrible. I could never do. I'm not very good at meditation. That's what I hear a lot. And the good news is meditation doesn't have to look any certain way. There are many, many ways to meditate. And these, these principles of being somewhere quiet so that you can really tune in and focus, being in a comfortable place, and then just allowing things to happen. So a meditation could be a body scan, just, you know, being calm, being present in your body, seeing where you're, where you're holding stress, strain, or pain, and then trying to release that, taking a few deep breaths, seeing how you feel. It could just be setting a timer for two minutes, closing your eyes and focusing on your breath. Um, you know, focusing on deep breath is incredibly soothing to our nervous system. It's a tactic you can use when you're having trouble sleeping or you're anxious. Uh, and it's a big part of meditation is just being calm, quiet, and breathing. So a two minute breath meditation is a great place to start. If you're like, I'm never going to be able to, 
you know, sit quietly in lotus position for 30 minutes. We don't expect that of you. It is a practice. So just like the gratitude practice, meditation and mindfulness is a practice. And it's just like planting a garden or getting ready for a sporting event. You don't throw seeds in the ground and expect to harvest it nine months later. And you don't start from the couch and run a marathon the next day. So just like working out in the gym, you've got to flex the gratitude muscle. You've got to try things over and over again. But it's really about allowing yourself some time for calm and peace uh, and focusing on deep breathing. And some people really lump mindfulness and meditation together. Um, you can have a mindfulness meditation, but I really like the idea of mindfulness. It's really just about being present and being aware. So I think this image, you know, <laughs> The, the human has their to-do list and all of their marital stress and everything in their mind the whole time that their dog, who's A, probably really grateful that their owner is taking them on a walk, they're just enjoying the scenery and really being present and um, open to the beauty of their surroundings. And that's really what mindfulness is. Can you be aware can you be in your body? You know, some of it is sensing maybe those feelings of stress and saying, okay, you know, what can I do about that? Do I take a deep breath? Um, so it's, again, it's a practice. Most of us are built to perform at a high level and have these things constantly in our brain. And it's okay to give our brains a break. We need that time to recharge and to be aware and present. So a couple winning strategies for us on that is starting with being where my feet are. That's great in sports. We use it to immediately ground us. If you just say, be where my feet are, it really makes you, number one, connect to where your feet are, bring yourself present. We like to use our meditation time for joy breaks. Joy breaks are another one of our skills that we have, and it's all about inserting joy. We do it for two or three minutes. It's a lot like a water break. So just like in sports, you would never not be hydrating. And now with lifestyle, we're also constantly hydrating. And so if you think about how do I hydrate with joy? So when you take that time and you are where your feet are and you are doing whatever you're doing, instead of trying to not think about anything, think about what brings you joy. Think about your 10 moments. Think about what you're grateful for. Think about the things that you like. The minute that we can get you engaged in thinking about joy, 10 moments, what you like, you're going to want more and more of that. And we're actually rewiring your brain to be aware of it and to pay attention to it so that we're letting go of the negativity. We're going to have it. We're going to have stress. We want it just to flow through us to serve the purpose that it needs to make us aware what we want to hold on to is the things that bring us joy, our 10 moments, all the really good stuff. That's awesome. I've, I've never heard about a joy break before. I'm going to start using that. Um, and, you know, one of the things with gratitude is that it really does shift you from the negative to the positive very quickly. So I've heard it said that you cannot be angry, sad, you know, worried at the same time that you're truly grateful. So I try to use it even like if I'm kind of mad at my husband, like, why did they do that? And then I, you know, I, or I can be like, I'm grateful that I have a partner, right? I'm grateful somebody else is picking up my kids today. So you can even use it in that moment to moment. Um, and as you were talking about, Carlette, you know, our brains are just running on these little automatic loops all the time. And if we can notice those loops and stop them by inserting the new thought, the new hope, right? To, to, to break down that um, automation in our brain. It's really positive for creating new habits. Well, and this is how we're empowered. This is the gift. We got this. We can do this. We truly can win our well-being. This is a sport that we can win on our own in terms of really starting with ourself and then beginning to connect with the people that are in alignment with our tens, the things that bring us joy, that interaction completely anchored in gratitude. So as we're focused on winning our well-being, love the whole person development, love bringing all of me into it and being able to really honor who am I personally, professionally, philanthropically, all of me matters so that I can show up and really be that 10 in my, in my life at home, at work, in the community that I want to serve and support. And so our next cue that we want to talk about in well-being cues are identity cue. 
And identity cue is really owning who are we, what's important to us, how do we take care of ourselves, and owning that everything we do starts with us. We cannot be amazing at work. We can't be a great partner, a parent. We just can't be this amazing person that we really want to be if we're not starting by being amazing to ourselves. So self-care is such a winning strategy on how we're going to raise our identity cue. Absolutely. And I always say that our relationship with ourself may be the most important relationship we have, right? Um, and the idea of self-care is um, very interesting to me. This was actually born out of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. So self-care was developed by civil rights leaders who were showing up every day to face insurmountable challenges. And how are you going to hold on to yourself and really come as your whole self when you're up against these really difficult things, um, trying to make progress. And so it is really important for us to think about what fills us up so that we can serve others, right? So that we can do the job we need to do so that we can perform the way we want to perform. And uh, it is very individualized. I mean, most people think self-care is bubble baths and pedicures and going on a shopping spree. Um, and that might be part of it, you know, giving yourself a gift can be a form of self-care, but it really gets down to how do I talk to myself? Do I spend time focusing on my mindset? Do I spend time getting my physical activity in? Am I prioritizing sleep? All of these pieces, you know, we could, I have developed a lifestyle medicine self-care kit. You could really go through the pillars and pick something that you need to do every day every week or, you know, once a month that is going to fuel your self-care because it's incredibly important as we're trying to prevent stress and strain uh, to really invest in ourselves in this way and um, creating a daily self-care practice that maybe includes gratitude, some exercise, drinking some water, you know, all of these things can be types of self-care. And so this is just to say that it's very individualized and it's not a one size fits all. Well, and what's so valuable is, again, doing that stat system of designing your 10 life, really going for what is it that makes me feel like a 10, really makes me feel like I'm ready to engage in the world. And what's so valuable about self-care, the new thinking is it is not about being selfish. <laughs> it is completely about taking care of me so that I can be the person I want to be in my life. I can be a great partner. I can be a great mom. I can do great at work. I can be great in my community. I mean, we all have that desire and yet we haven't spent any time thinking about how do I get there? It's so interesting that we think about work. What's our pathway? What's our purpose? Mm -hmm. What are we doing? We want this playbook. We want everything outlined. Well, new skill, let's outline really how to win our self-care and own that as intentionally as we own our career paths or we own if people love working out, there's nothing that's going to get in the way of you having your workout in. Well, great. Let's make sure there's nothing that's going to get in the way of you owning your self-care because as soon as I see you valuing you, you mm -hmm. train me how to treat you. And so that's the gift of really being able to demonstrate this live it to give it model of, wow, Here's how I take great care of myself so that I can be great for you. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, you've probably heard some of the cliches about self-care, like you can't pour from an empty cup or, you know, when we we're traveling, what did the, what did they tell us? Put your own oxygen mask on first. And the, uh, you know, analogy that I learned recently that resonates with me so much because of my healthcare profession, but I think most people get it is um, our our anatomic heart, you know, that pumps oxygenated blood throughout our body. What's the first organ that the heart feeds? The brain. No, it's the heart. Oh, it takes care of a heart. Okay. <laughs> the, the left and right coronary arteries come off at the base of the aorta, which is the large artery that feeds the rest of the body. So as the aortic valve closes, oxygen rich blood goes into the heart first within milliseconds. And as you said, the brain doesn't think the heart is selfish because it gives oxygen to itself first, because the brain would be in a worse off place if the heart stopped beating, right? And you know, of course, all the organ systems work together, but you know, the heart can't beat if it doesn't give itself oxygen first. 
And in a room full of physicians, most of them will say the brain or the lungs, you know? So um, <laughs> you're in good company, Carlette. That, um, so I just wanted to share that because it really resonates with me and uh, a lot of my patients and colleagues as well. Well, I love self-care being about the heartbeat of who we are and just the gift of taking care of our heart. I know certainly physically we're obsessed with taking care of our heart. We know how valuable it is. What great new thinking for you to give us that, wow, let's actually think of it as the organ that it is and really kind of the heart and soul of this team of our body, you know, our mind, our heart, our organs, it all starts with our heartbeat. And wow, team, I don't know about you, but I love thinking about my self-care as really feeding my heart and taking care of me. And we can look at it from different perspectives of what is it that makes my heart feel grateful, feel joy, feel like a 10? And how do I insert more of that into my life and make it a ritual and routine? This is such a winning strategy that you really invest in you. Find the time on your day in your calendar and say, this is what I'm doing for me. Okay, wow, team, what a lot of new thinking, new skills, and new hope we have learned. Dr. Hunter, thank you so much for the gift of being on this journey to just begin to understand, be curious, and become aware of how to really raise our well-being cue and be for us in such an intentional way. I love the whole person. Really important that every part of us matters. We are worthy of the investment that it takes. And I know you and I are doing a series, so team to be continued. We've got lots more to talk about. We just wanted to start today by getting you aware of what is lifestyle medicine and get you thinking about what are the changes that I want to make. So Dr. Hunter, thank you for being on our team and being such a champion for well-being. Thank you, Carlette. It truly is my passion and I love sharing about it with more and more people. So I appreciate the opportunity. So team, it's up to you. Go out and win your well-being. Think about how you can raise your well-being cue. What new rituals and routines do you want to try? Stat it up when you do it. That's on a scale of one to 10. We're looking to live in that eight, nine, or 10 zone. So remember, give yourself a week or so to try it. See if you can raise your stat and just learn more about you. We'll see you next week. Thank you very much.